The first Fable was a solid game, but after all the promises that had been made, it was also viewed as a disappointment. Expectations were kept to a minimum this time around, and so the delivery isn't quite as big an event. Even if Fable 2 manages to live up to the promises of the first game, it's a landmark achievement. But is this living, breathing waltz through Fantasyland a thing of legends or a cautionary tale? Words can't even begin to describe it. <laughs> we live in grim times indeed, if the young are too world-weary to believe in magic. Set half a century after the first game, Fable 2 is a tale of revenge, with only loose ties to the pros from the first. At the outset, your sister is murdered, and you set off on a path to bring those responsible to justice. All roads lead to Lord Lucian, a diabolical being that is enslaving the people of Albion. You must build your legend and ascend through any means necessary to stop Lucian's assault on all that is good. That's not to say that you have to be. It's your choice in whether you tread down the path of good or get your hands dirty as an evildoer. The plot is furthered by in-game cinematics and a few pre-rendered CG sequences for monumental moments, and while it gives the illusion of choice, it ultimately ends the same way. It's just how you get there that's different. Even so, in the days of far too many bald space marines wiping out alien hordes, Fable 2's attempt at a non-linear story is refreshing. He's a bit silly, isn't he? But this could be fun. <laughs> I've been sitting here thousands of years, and I've seen it all. Far too many games these days provide you with a confrontation, and when you overcome it, a door opens to yet another. Fable 2 is truly freeform in comparison. If you plow through the main quest, you can finish it in around 10 hours, give or take. But if you take the time to make the rounds and truly explore, you can glean countless hours of entertainment from it. Quests pop up constantly. Whether it's clearing a road of bandits or rescuing slaves, it's your choice in what order you tackle them. The more time you spend on side missions, the easier the main quest becomes as you build your skills in melee combat, magic, and ranged weapons with each victory or discovered treasure chest. There's a simple warp system in place that will get you close to each destination, yet you'll still tire of running down the same pathways and route to the next objective. Very little grinding is involved. There are a couple points where a certain level of renown is required, but otherwise you're free to develop your character however you choose. Getting lost is practically impossible, since a magical trail always guides the way. Like the first game, the decisions you make alter how people in the world perceive you. Kill an innocent and rob him of his gold, and you'll hear it from the townsfolk. Walk the path of the righteous, and you'll buy items and weapons on the cheap. It's well balanced, no matter which path you take. Yeah! Look at you go! Like most role-playing games, success depends upon how you manage your money, weapons, and potions, but there are much deeper levels than that. Socializing is important to build your reputation, though the way it's handled is rather shallow. You have scores of canned interactions that range from dancing a jig to letting a rip, and each person has specific interactions that they enjoy. Manipulating someone's impression of your character can lead to gifts or ultimately marriage. It's all very hollow, though. You simply look at what the person enjoys and dislikes and spam an annoying timing game until the proper state is reached. It gets old fast, but there's no denying the charm of Albion citizens mentioning your exploits, whether good or bad. You're, without doubt, the biggest celebrity I've ever seen. Grounding an otherwise fantastically bleak game is the dog. Your faithful companion is at your side through thick and thin, helping you sniff out hidden treasure chests, buried items, and alerting you to danger. He'll even jump on fallen enemies for a couple of chomps. You have no direct control over the dog, and how much you reward him matters little, but he removes a lot of the tedium from the genre, cutting down on aimless searching. Perhaps most importantly, he makes the game personal. Knowing that whatever you do is always seen by someone or something adds weight to your actions. You'll have to pay for that. Without gold, you can't survive, and there are a couple of ways to build your bank account. The most obvious is to work a job. Pounding out iron at the blacksmith won't make you rich, but you can take on special missions like assassinations that will get you on your way. Real estate is the true key to wealth, as any properties you own will net you rent every five minutes, whether you're playing or not. Every last property and business is for sale, but if you get in on it too early, you'll find yourself swimming in cash, eliminating a lot of challenge from the game. The final element is the online cooperative play. As advertised, players can drop in or out at any time, but your custom character cannot appear in anyone else's world. 
You get the money and experience you collect while playing with someone else, but you have to choose from a handful of default characters, and then the loot is transferred back to your game. It's hard to care. Fable 2 is really the only game of its kind, incorporating elements of The Legend of Zelda, The Sims, SimCity, and traditional RPGs into one open-ended game. Not all of its parts are successful, but its scope is hard to match. <laughs> When you're juggling three different styles of combat, the interface has to be elegant, and Fable 2 manages to streamline what could be a complete mess. The X button is mapped to melee, the Y button is for ranged weapons, and the B button sparks of magic. That's the basics, and just about anyone can come to grips with it quickly. There are nuances to each, though. When you first begin with ranged combat, you use an auto lock-on, but as you upgrade, you're able to aim in first person. When you begin with the basics of close quarter skill, you eventually upgrade to combos, charged attacks, and parries. The melee is responsive, quick, and deep enough to remain fun. You'll be buying, selling, and using all manner of cleaver, hammer, and sword, and firing ranged weapons like crossbows and flintlock pistols. Augments can be used to imbue some weapons with special power, and overall, it's hard to fault the arsenal. Magic is easily the deepest of all three combat mechanics. Each spell can be upgraded to five different levels. The longer you hold the B button, the more powerful the attack. And there's a simple tree that allows you to slot specific spells to each power level, providing for a lot of flexibility. Our favorite combination was starting with a slow time spell to stop the enemy's attack, then casting Raise the Dead to distract them with ghost enemies, and then following up with a high level attack spell like Shock. Then we jump in and finish them off with melee. How you tackle each altercation is entirely up to you. Fable 2's combat is a nice mix of accessibility and depth. The problem is that once you master it, the game fails to put up a fight. We didn't even die in the entire first half of the game. When you do perish, the punishment is far too lenient. You lose a little experience, take a scar, and then pick up the battle right where you left it off. You never run out of magic, so you can use it as a crutch when things get dicey. Eventually, we started completely ignoring our health level, hoarding potions for some ultra-difficult section that never came. It doesn't help that they're just a handful of enemy types, and the few bosses that are in the game are all defeated the same easy way. Whether you end up purity incarnate or a bastion of depravity isn't easy to control. Fable 2 does a good job of putting you between a rock and a hard place, and it's one of the few games that makes you think about the ramifications of your actions. Sometimes the gray areas are a little too gray, but it only makes multiple plays worthwhile. Fable 2 is a complex game made easy. It may seem intimidating, but even novice players will find little resistance. If you're a seasoned player, you'll wish for more of a challenge, but the combat provides enough depth for experimentation that your interest won't fade. The visuals are like a plastic surgery patient. It all looks great from afar, but when you get up close, the flaws are exposed. On a technical level, it's not going to turn many heads, but it has its moments. The dog is pulled off especially well. How it reacts to you and the situations around it can be eerily realistic. Magic effects are also impressive, and the engine manages to hold up despite the strain. The art design is also a win. The theme is at one moment charming and the next foreboding, yet you always feel like you're traveling through one consistent world. The people don't fare as well. Though there are dozens of them on screen at once, the character models are blocky and feature minimal animation. Considering how much time you spend interacting with them, it's an issue. Hey, you're disturbing our beauty sleep! The audio is incredible. The voice acting sessions for this game must have lasted weeks. Each citizen of Albion has something to say based upon how you're playing and how you're interacting with them, yet few lines are misread. There are no throwaways in the musical compositions, with the haunting pause screen music setting the tone. Fable 2 is a game with heart, and there are so few of them released these days. It'll make you think, and take you beyond bloodlust, yet you can satisfy that too if you wish. It's far too easy, the social and job aspects are a drag, and the main quest ends just when it seems to be getting started, but when you return to town and the people are a buzz of your exploits, much is forgiven. 
It's a more refined version of the original that still hasn't lost all its warts, but it manages to channel many separate ideas into one enjoyable whole.